Okay, so before you read the title of this video in panic, <laughs> I need to assure you, um, nothing bad is happening. I'm not closing down the channel. I'm not dying of some illness. Nothing bad is happening, but the title does have a very specific meaning that we'll get into a little bit later. As always, the structure of this update video is going to go like it normally does. I'm going to front load all of the channel information right up front. So if that's what you're interested in, you can just get that out of the way real quick. Then I'm going to transition that into what the title of this video means and uh, some of the stuff that I'm still gonna be doing on YouTube and social media, but sort of outside of just the channel itself. And then uh, for all of you weirdos out there who have an interest in my personal life, um, I have been promising for a while that I was gonna go over in a video what's been going on since uh, about half a decade ago now. <laughs> and I've been putting this off for a while. I'm gonna give an update as to like what's been going on in my real life, uh, why there's been such a lack of videos and some other, you know, more personal stuff again for the people who care about that kind of stuff. So uh, I guess let's go ahead and just start getting into it. So obviously the thing everybody cares about right now is Metamorphosis, so let me explain what's going on there. Um, I'm working on the next two episodes of Metamorphosis together, uh, in that they are pretty much going to be films, scripted, and even uploaded pretty much right next to each other. Like as soon as you see episode 12 go up, you'll know that episode 13 is coming within a few days of episode 12 going up. Um, they are very, very interconnected. It is almost impossible to talk about one without talking about the other, so they need to be as close to each other as possible, which has some upsides and downsides. The upside, of course, is going to be that from your perspective, you're going to be getting two episodes pretty much back to back. And then, you know, from my perspective, it basically means that if I can't work on both at the same time, uh, <laughs> you're not getting either of them until I can get both of them done to completion, basically. So if you're somebody who was part of the Naruto metagame and you don't remember why 13 would uh, <laughs> be so difficult to film, let me first say that uh, I've been working on the script for the video and currently it's looking to be about a three hour episode, <laughs> which is insane. I'll just say right from the front, uh, I like that you guys like the series, and uh, I, I know that there are going to be some outliers here or there, but I don't think anybody wants a straight-up three-hour episode <laughs> of the Naruto Metamorphosis series. I just don't think, I don't think anybody's going to be into that outside of one or two uh, people. So I'm looking for a way to cut that down first. Um, I don't think three hours is acceptable. I think three hours needs to get toned down to, I, I honestly don't want any of the episodes to go above two hours, especially with how, you know, I like to ramble. You know, I, I'm a very talkative person. And if you let me go, I will just go on forever. So that three hours could easily be three and a half hours by the time I actually get my god dang points across. Um, so right now I'm looking for a way to cut that down a little bit. But if you're somebody who, again, played the Naruto metagame at the time uh, and you just can't really place uh, 13, like you don't really know where 13 fits or why it would take three hours to explain everything, let me go over some of the stuff, okay? This is the set where we got cold-headed Sasuke. We got the introduction of the squad deck and squad cards. We got the Sasori that revives, which is going to be just... So much fun to talk about. Mother and father puppets, the third Kaze Kage puppets, and that's just the tip of the iceberg for stuff that I need to talk about. Uh, then we, of course, we have to talk about the stuff, the Deidata supports, the Uchiha supports, the medical ninjas. It's just a lot of stuff happened in set 13. If you don't remember, refresh your memory, go to ccgtrader.com or whatever and refresh your memory because it's, it's a lot. And again, I, I have some little rants and stuff that I want to put in. I want to talk a little bit about the power creep that really happened around this time. So, yeah, <laughs> that's I would expect that stuff sometime within this next two weeks. But again, it's not going to happen until 12 and 13 can both get done properly. Um, my hopes for this series, uh, as you guys should know by now, this isn't supposed to be a Naruto-only series. It's supposed to be 
a look at old card games. In fact, I did an entire 12-hour live stream going over all of the card games I'd like to cover for this series. The Naruto project was supposed to be over within about one to two years of me starting it, and it has now been six years, so... We're not going to work on anything Metamorphosis related until Naruto's finished. I, I can promise you guys that. Um, so my hope is that by next year, I mean by the end of next year for anybody who's going to try and grammar, grammar rule me on that one. Um, by the end of next year, I'd like to just have Naruto completely done. Nothing more to say about it. Um, if if there's still a little bit of like hunger for Naruto content, there's a chance that maybe I could go back and do some deck reviews or uh, you know some one or two little things about Naruto. I've even considered maybe covering some of the fan made sets. Like um, there's a fan made set for thirty and on um, that introduced some pretty neat stuff. So maybe I wouldn't count on it, but maybe I could get into that stuff too if people are just super dying for more Naruto stuff once this entire series is done. But once that is finished, I want to have probably about two to three different series of Metamorphosis running concurrently. So it's not just focused on one particular card game because I don't ever want Metamorphosis to be just one about one card game you know I want to talk about uh, two to three card games at a time probably like one fairly long card game and then from there I'll throw in like two pretty short card games I can do in the meantime they can get finished pretty quickly so right now, I'm thinking those games are going to be... Uh, I want to go back and finish the Digimon card game. I already did a ton of work for that. It'd be a shame to let that work go to waste, even though I'm going to have to redo some of the work anyway, because I've got some lost files, but that's all right. Um, it's just a bunch of comparing and contrasting powers, which, you know... And plus, I have to continue Digimon, because you guys will not believe. <laughs> I, if you guys, If you guys were shocked by how incompetently handled the first set was, you will not believe how poorly the second set handled the first set. So Digimon's gonna get continued. I've also been scripting out things for the Zatch Bell card game, which is a personal favorite of mine. Can't wait to go back and talk about that. And then of course, the next big series we're gonna be covering is My Little Pony. Seems like that card game is done and dusted. It has been for quite a long time now. And My Little Pony was a pretty big thing on the channel for a long time. So I would love to go back and talk about it. Um, a lot of people in the My Little Pony card game community seem to remember me, which is interesting. It'll be a lot easier to get information if people are uh, familiar with me already. And even though even though people know me for My Little Pony, it's <laughs> the funny thing is like I didn't really get into the competitive side of the game. I kind of just made like really fun stuff. Um a fan of mine actually took one of my uh deck ideas. It was the the Pinky Sparkle Surprise Engine, I think I called it, which was like an interaction of uh, Twilight Sparkle and Pinkie Pie and just discarding your opponent's entire field using an unintended <laughs> mechanic that was introduced to the game. So, yeah, I don't really know too, too much about the actual competitive side of the game. Of course, if you have any information, feel free to contact me on Discord, Facebook, cite some sources, and um, I'd be really excited to hear from you. Um, now, one of the things that people have been asking me about, uh, not lately, obviously, but like three years ago, people were asking me about this, is, is there a way that I would ever go back and cover Weiss Swartz content again, or include Weiss Swartz in my Metamorphosis series? And i go ahead and answer that right now. I don't have a problem with going back and covering Weiss Swartz again. It's not that I hate it. I, I still think, I, I, I'm amazed. I am sh in shock and awe that this long out from the days where I used to cover Weiss Swartz, there still isn't like another unique 
fluid, well, well-maintained card game like Weiss Swartz. In fact, Weiss Swartz ballooning up into getting all of these Disney projects and like <laughs> basically becoming the titan that it is. Eventually, eventually it's going to reach more into shonen stuff and eventually I'm sure we're going to start seeing sets on like Dragon Ball and One Piece and all that. Even though Bandai has a license now, I'm sure one day Weiss Swartz will get the money to borrow those licenses and get really start getting some ips cooking um it shocks me to this day no other card game has come out and really done something as unique as wife swartz um one of the games that i'm planning on covering uh, at some point is union arena and even though i'm really excited to cover it uh, I am a little disappointed, and I will talk about this when I actually make a, an official video on it. I'm a little disappointed at how similar it is to other card games that we've already seen. We've gone back to Shields. <sighs> I used to love Kaijudo. I used to love Duel Masters, but I am so up to here with Shields in card games. I do not want to see any more card games come out to do the Shield thing. Um, I like the way that the mana system kind of works. That's kind of cool. But I am so done with shield mechanics in card games. <laughs> Let that mechanic die. Let's start experimenting with some new stuff. But anyways, Weiss Wars, right? <laughs> okay, let's get back. All right, so Weiss Wars. Um, I have a bit of a compromise with Weiss Wars that I like to do that I talked about in the live stream uh, from last year. Um. With Weiss Swartz, I figure instead of going through and talking about each set in depth, because that would be like a 200 part series, that's not a joke or an exaggeration. It legitimately would end up being at least a 200 part series. Um, but I, instead of doing that, instead of talking about each set individually, I would just talk about years. So I would talk about the first year that Weiss Swartz was out. Uh, which series ended up being uh, the top competitive series, which ones didn't. Maybe I would give small mentions to each of the series that came out uh, within a particular year. Maybe talk a bit about why or why not that set ended up becoming uh, popular or viable. And that's how I would handle it if I went back and talked about Weiss Swartz. Um, as, as we're talking about Weiss Swartz outside of Metamorphosis and not having it be a Metamorphosis series, again, I wouldn't hate it. Um, but I feel like nowadays there are enough channels that talk about Weiss Swartz well. Like Lunchbox does some really interesting Weiss Swartz content. So, like, what am I going to really bring to the table that other people already aren't? This is one of the major, big reasons that I don't cover big card games, right? I don't cover Pokemon. I don't cover Magic the Gathering. I don't cover Yu-Gi-Oh! Because if you want that content, there's a lot of it on YouTube, and some of it's pretty good. <laughs> like the Yu-Gi-Oh community, I don't, I'm, I don't follow the Yu-Gi-Oh card game at all anymore. Um, outside of you know, yeah, following some stuff, but I don't really play the game at all. I haven't touched it since forever ago. But Yu-Gi-Oh, Yu-Gi tubers are actually pretty entertaining. Some of them. Uh, Nim being one of the ones that I really like to follow. Uh, Nim Nim, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I don't really see what I could bring to that space. So now that Weiss Swartz is big enough that there are other people in the space doing cool stuff in the space, what do I need to do there anymore? <laughs> There's nothing left to accomplish. So I'd rather spend my time covering um, card games that don't have representation, card games that are dying that people have forgotten about, you know, card games that if I don't get on here and talk about them, who else in the entire world is going to get on here and talk about them? That's kind of where I want to spend my time. So it's not likely, but if there's a huge push for me to go back to the Weiss Swartz space, it's possible I could. Uh, I think Metamorphosis is probably the best compromise uh, I have in doing that, though. So as I hinted at before, uh, I do want to cover Union Arena. Um, it seems like a really cool game. I, it's the first card game since Lorcana that I've been like really hyped about or really excited about. And since I missed the entire Lorcana train, and now that Lorcana is kind of an awful game <laughs> to play competitively, and I don't really have an interest in covering it, um, 
Un- Union Arena is like the next thing that I'm like, okay, this is really cool. I'd really like to get in this space. Um, I missed the release date. I was supposed to have a video out on the release date, and some stuff happened, and I didn't. So my bad. It's kind of expected at this point from me, but uh, at some point, Union Arena is something I will be covering on this channel extensively. Um, they're going to do a review slash tutorial video like I normally do. There's probably going to be some set reviews, and... Yeah, I'm really excited to talk about it. Uh, the other one that I'm going to cover, though, that is kind of big, and actually, <laughs> by the time you watch this, I'll probably be covering it already, is uh, The Bazaar. So The Bazaar is a game I found about three years ago. Um, there's a competitive Hearthstone player named Raynad, who is my is my senpai. I do love him a lot. Um, I didn't really get into Hearthstone, but ever since finding out about him like three years ago, I've been going and binge watching all of his old content. He has such an interesting philosophy when it comes to the card gaming space that I just I can't help but love him, even though I'm not into Hearthstone. Um, and I've been following his project, The Bazaar, for just as long as I've known about him. Um, I backed his game, The Bazaar, at the highest possible tier, so going to get all the goodies, all the rewards, and if you've never heard of the Bazaar before, <laughs> it's basically going to be like an online game that functions like an RPG tabletop game, right? So the basic premise of it is um, you have to go through events, and events will give you items and resources that you need to build a spread of uh, basically battle items, right? So you can get items that increase your HP or your sh- uh, shields or whatever, and then you can get actual weapons to fight your opponent, and you have to create a good enough spread to beat your opponent before they beat you, and then after a certain amount of time, uh, a winner is decided, right? That's it. <laughs> it's, it's like a fight to the death between players, but in between the player fights, you're also going through the same kind of events and stuff you would be in in RPG. So uh, if you've ever played Kingdom Death, if you've ever played Primal the Awakening, those kinds of games, it's those, it's those elements inside of a competitive PvP game. And it's just so awesome. Speaking of the bazaar, actually, uh, if I can convince 10 people to uh, sign up under my code <laughs> and you've never heard of the game before, or if you just feel like helping your old boy Kudo out, you know, um, I stopped asking for likes and subscriptions and stuff in my videos. I don't do that kind of thing anymore. I don't put sponsored ads or anything in my videos. So <laughs> if you would like to do your old boy Kudo a favor here, <laughs> I would be very appreciative if you could click on that link that I'm going to have pinned in the comment section below. Sign up for the game. Even if you don't end up playing it, even if you, uh, you know, you don't have to pay for anything, it's completely free. It's just if I can get 10 of you guys to do it, uh, I get something really cool. That would make me really happy. So, you know, again, I don't I don't hound you guys for stuff usually. And if I'm going to put my audience for towards anything, it's, it's going to be little things like this. So it just 10 of you out there love me enough to, <laughs> to click on the link. I would be very, very appreciative. Um, anyways. Uh, when I get back into streaming, that's the game that I'm planning on streaming. Um, it seems like a very nice game to stream, partly because Raynad himself is a streamer and understands the streaming space really well. So he's built this game in a way that streaming and having conversations with people in your chat is going to be very simple. I remember back when I used to do card game streams, uh, one of the most difficult things about streaming card games is... Games that in real life last about 20 to 30 minutes can easily last like two to three hours when you're streaming. Because uh, in between actually playing with the other person, you know, first of all, you have an unlimited amount of time to think. So turns that would normally go by in 10 to 15 seconds usually last about two to three minutes in uh, an online space like this (laughs) because people are just taking forever on their turns. They're they, they have as much time as they need to think ahead, and, you know, I'm guilty of this too. My turns would sometimes take forever. I go back and watch my old streams every once in a while, and I know how bad it can be. So, you know, I think this game is going to be really good for the streaming space. I think it's going to be a really fun game to get back in and stream with. You know, it's it's still it's a card game 
you know, even though technically you're not looking at what you would call cards normally, but it's still card game in spirit. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting into that. Uh, I really hope you guys can bear with me while I get all of that sorted. Even though, so there's also another little problem here I should probably talk about ahead of time before the actual streaming day hits. Um, <sighs> my computer has a bit of an overheating problem. I think it developed this problem uh, over this last year or so. Um, admittedly, it has been out in some pretty terrible conditions. You know, it's got it's probably got dust. It's probably got a little bit of water damage in it. It's it's not the computer's fault necessarily, but it's still an issue. Um, I'm trying to get back into uh, games like Final Fantasy XIV. I got into World of Warcraft for a little while, um, and you know, even playing things like Ghost of Tsushima. My computer will crash, and I'm almost positive it's an overheating issue, so I need to figure out what I'm going to do about that. Hopefully, hopefully it can handle streaming a card game <laughs> without crashing, but I have no guarantees. Um, I'll have to figure something else out if this computer doesn't work out. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll get it figured out. You know, I, I just want to, you know, front end this by saying there's a chance that streaming won't end out working the way I want it to because my computer will crash during a stream but maybe it won't maybe everything will go swimmingly and uh, I'm just saying all of this for nothing so you know we'll see so in addition to Union Arena and the Bazaar um, I also would like to start making some more general card gaming videos things like <laughs> card gaming philosophy um, one of the videos that I'm just, I'm chomping at the bit, I cannot wait to release to you guys. I've been preparing this for like three months now, and it's, I'm so excited to make this. I would like to make a deck building video that works for every single card game ever, right? So here's the idea. One of the things that people praise me for, and one of the things I'm very like humbled by is people tends to give me some credit for being able to build decks out of things that don't typically seem like they would work within a card game. Uh, people have like a really fun idea for like a casual deck. I'll take that casual idea and I'll turn it, to, I'll turn it and it's something mildly competitive um, that really shy, surprises or shocks people. You know, uh, like I was saying before, somebody took my pinky sparkle surprise engine and used it in uh, a deck that actually went on to get like top five at a regionals or something, which was fantastic. It was super cool. Um, and I would like to make a video showing you guys sort of my uh creative process my philosophy when it comes to turning things that normally aren't good ideas into competitively viable decks and sort of during that video go over you know some of the things that i notice or some of the things that uh, i focus on that make my decks function as well as they do so you know it's going to be the kind of video that like if you love the deck building aspect of card games or if you like the idea but you're intimidated by it and uh, you've never really built your own deck and you've net decked all your stuff but there's like an idea or two that you want to play around with it should be for you it's going to be a very very interesting video i think it's going to be sort of my magnum opus of like modern day kudokun content and it's it's going to be a ride uh, i really hope you guys like that video it'll it'll hurt my feelings a lot <laughs> if that video doesn't do well but I digress. Uh, so more general videos, Union Arena and the Bazaar are content that are coming out alongside, obviously, Metamorphosis content. So we've been talking for quite a while and I haven't really explained the title of the video. Let's go ahead and get into that. Um, I am going to start up a brand new channel soon, which is something that if you've been in the Kudokun space for a while, you know that I've been playing around with this idea for a long time. There was under the radar gaming that I tried to start where <laughs> I looked at like, uh, I did basically the same thing I do with card games. I looked for games that people weren't really talking about that I was interested in and then uploaded videos about them in the video game space. Um, I tried to do like a Kudo After Hours channel where like I just talked candidly to the camera about stuff while uh, sipping a cup of coffee. By the way, I still have it. 
delicious. Um, and then I sort of transitioned all of that stuff into stuff for the Kudokun channel because my my main philosophy for YouTube is there's not really a reason to have multiple channels because it's just going to be you if you make five videos in a month and you put three on one channel and two on the other channel it's just kind of a hassle to watch all five of the videos and most of the people who are here are here for me not necessarily just the content but me covering the content so I've always been hesitant on making another channel because I've never really had a reason to but now that I'm a bit older uh, I actually think now is a good time to uh, release uh, content on a new channel and the reason for it is um, I would like to start getting more into the Japanese and teaching space this is something that people have known about me for a while um, I speak Japanese I teach Japanese as like my main profession I even I'm even working on like a Japanese teaching series like a like a book series if if you've never seen them before i'm gonna go ahead and put up an image here of a of a girl this is shio she is my my pride and joy she's basically the the face of all of my teaching content and you know i'll, I'll even throw up another picture or something here too so and i'll even put up another picture somewhere around here too of her little brother Kosho, and this is Shio and Kosho, and they're like uh, the two mascots of my teaching series. And I'm writing a book about them that will hopefully help kids get into Japanese. You know, Japanese is like the most requested language that children want to learn how to speak, and there's almost no content directed squarely at them to get them into the language. So you know, I'm I'm excited to get all of that stuff in, but you know, my life has kind of been on pause for the past <laughs> four or five years, and you know, this is yeah, I want to make a channel where I can go more into teaching, get myself really established as like a um Japanese, you know, speaker, and like really try and get into this space and you know, get myself ready for, you know, whatever comes of that. <laughs> that's that's basically it. Um, so this new channel is going to be not only for my Japanese teaching and stuff, but also that is where in the future, if, like if I have life updates or if I want to give updates on like how I'm doing, that's where it's going to be. The new channel is going to be for like real life stuff, Japanese teaching and stuff around like my professional life. And this is the place where my hobby stuff is going to go. Now, I'm a little on the fence about some of my stuff, like, obviously, like, I love to play video games, but my video game content is really inconsistent here on the channel. Most of it, over a certain period of time, tends to do well. I get a few thousand views on all of my video game reviews, which I think is awesome. Like, one of my most viewed video has, like, 40,000 views, <laughs> and it's just, like, a random Ed Train Odyssey video I did, so... Obviously, that stuff can do pretty well here, but it's not a guarantee, and I know that a lot of people do not like when I stray too far away from my normal stuff, which I think is totally fair. I think that is absolutely fair uh, of you guys to do if I'm uploading content that you're not really a big fan of and you want to unsubscribe, take a break from the channel, whatever it is. I do not begrudge you that whatsoever. You know, if your favorite restaurant is not serving the dishes you like, you are more than welcome to go somewhere else and get those dishes until that restaurant gets its act together. I totally understand that. I'm not begrudging you guys in the slightest. Um, however, there is a sort of pressure that also comes with having co content that people like <laughs> and wanting to not only do that content. Um, I think one of the most frustrating things, and this is one of those things that you do not understand until you become a content creator yourself, because I know there was a time in my life where I probably didn't really fully believe this. Um, there's a there's a concept of like, if I dedicate time to anything else, it's coming at the expense of the content that you want. You know, there's a lot of times where I've been working on like, say, uh, a metamorphosis video, like a Naruto metamorphosis video. And during that time that I'm making it, I need to reach out to people on Discord, reach out to people on Reddit. Uh, I need to like scroll through forums go into the Wayback Machine, see what I can find there. 
there's a lot of stuff outside of actually making the video that um, I need to do to get it ready. And sometimes I'm just waiting on responses from people or sometimes um, I'm just waiting for like audio issues to get sorted out or I need I need to get like graphics ready for something, you know? There's, there's a lot of stuff outside of my control that stops me from making a metamorphosis video sometimes. So in that time, there are other videos that I would love to make that I just don't because I'm worried that if I upload too much content that isn't related to the metamorphosis video, that it's going to upset a lot of people and people are going to take that as I'm choosing to do this content as opposed to the metamorphosis content. So I know I wanna be very careful with how I say this, right? I don't want anybody to come away from this feeling like I am upset at you or uh, you're, you're doing something negative to me by liking some of my content. Never in a million years do I want anybody to feel like that. Uh, I am super grateful to everybody who's been following the Naruto videos. Um, I really enjoy making them. It's It's been some of the most fun that I've had on YouTube ever, um, including my early days. You know, I don't, I don't even, <laughs> my channel's not even monetized anymore. <laughs> like I don't, I don't make any money. I don't beg you guys for likes and subs and that kind of stuff. Um, I don't take sponsorships. Um, I, I do not get anything out of it besides the enjoyment that I get from connecting with you guys about something I like, you know, something that I really struggled with in my adult life is, um, I have a lot of interests and hobbies and I kind of define myself through those interests and hobbies. And I know some people say like, that's pathetic, but that's just, that's how I am. That's who I am. I've accepted that. And, uh, you know, my, when I get into things like a new game or uh, a new show or something like that, the best way I have to connect to other people is by connecting with them through that game or through that show or through whatever that hobby is so the fact that i have a platform like this where i can make content and really connect with people who i never would have met in real life um who can actually appreciate the stuff that i get into that's that means something to me um i don't want to get <laughs> i don't want to get too sappy here but you know the if I didn't have that, it would be extremely detrimental. If I couldn't get on here and talk about the stuff that I love and find other people who will just leave that little comment saying, you know what, I totally get it. I love this thing too. I'm super happy you talked about it. You made my day by uploading this video and talking about this thing that I don't hear anybody else talk about. That's that's such a, a, a feeling that I can't even explain to you guys. So... Um, I just, I want to be clear when I say this, I love that I can make content that you guys enjoy, but there is also kind of a shackle on me when I can't upload that content that people will get upset that I'm not uploading the content that they like, because the, the perception is that if I'm uploading content <laughs> about video games or, uh, if I'm uploading content about like different card games or if I'm doing like rant videos or like the Kudo After Hours videos, um, that it's coming at the expense of the next episode. Like if I just hadn't done like a, a video about my video game collection, um, the next Naruto video would have been the replacement there. If I upload four videos about, you know, Scattered Nexus, which is another card game that I'm, I'm super into because, you know, it's made by somebody I consider a, a pretty decent friend, um, that, like, if I upload four videos for Scattered Nexus, you know, uh, that's four uh, Metamorphosis videos that just didn't get done. So I want to assure you guys, <laughs> if I don't upload a Metamorphosis video, there's probably stuff going on behind the scenes. There's probably people that I need to talk to. There's probably research I need to do. It does not come at the expense of Metamorphosis if I upload other stuff. However, again, I understand the frustration of getting too many things that you don't like um, in comparison to you know, getting the thing that you really do like. And I think that having another channel that I can really do something creative on without it interfering with stuff on my main channel is going to be like, it's, it's basically the tipping point for me deciding, okay, I need another place to make content. 
So that's what I'm going to do. Um, the name of the channel I've decided is going to be Sammy Senpai. You should be able to find a link to that in the description below somewhere if I've remembered to put it there. Not, not a guarantee. <laughs> um, and basically, in my professional career, I call myself Sammy Sensei, just because it's like a really catchy name. <laughs> Sammy Sensei, I love it. It's so good. Um, but I've decided, you know, here on YouTube, that's there's something kind of there's something kind of like stiff sounding about that. You know, for one thing, I'll fully admit I'm not the absolute best Japanese speaker out there. I've gotten to a point where I can play my video games in Japanese. I can uh, read my manga in Japanese, and for the most part, I can watch anime like uh, Detective Conan and stuff in Japanese. Um, but you know, if somebody if if I go on with the sensei title, I think there's going to be a lot of people uh, who, first of all, are going to feel like I'm competition for them. Like I don't want to make any enemies in the <laughs> Japanese speaking community just by having something in my name. Um, but it's also it also creates a level of expectation where people like if I like forget what a word means or if somebody asks me to say something in Japanese and I stumble. There's like this, oh, he's he's not a sensei at all. He's, he sucks at this. <laughs> you know, I don't want to, I don't really want to create that level of expectation for myself. But if I lower it down to senpai, well, it changes things a little bit, you know? That's a lot less stiff, you know? That's a, that's a much more relatable thing. Because like a sensei is somebody who's like mastered something and can teach it at like a high level. And a senpai is just somebody who is also a learner, just like you are, but has been in the space for a little bit longer and can maybe show you a thing or two and help you out a little bit. So that's what I'm going to do. You know, here on YouTube, I'm going to go into Sammy Senpai, and it's going to be a lot of fun. I think that a lot of that pressure's taken off. If somebody catches me out on something, I don't know. It's just a really simple shrug, and I can just say, yeah, you know, it's, I'm still learning. I, I acknowledge I don't know everything yet. Uh, if you're looking for a master of Japanese, if you're looking for an official teacher, you know, Japanese from zero, um, Amonomisa, there's a lot of other places you can go to for that. Here, we're just going to chill, relax, and maybe I'll give you some tips or two that'll help you out as a fellow Japanese learner. So, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, another thing that this comes with is uh, the mascot. Um, this is something that I've gotten a lot of let's call it pushback <laughs> over these last few years. I've basically stopped using um, Okino Subaru as like my channel mascot, and I've started using a new design that I came up with, um, who was going to be like my VTuber um, avatar. I kind of got out of the VTuber thing. Um, not super happy with where the VTuber space is currently at, but you know, this is like my new guy who represents me. And there's been some pushback, of course, because people are so used to Okino Subaru being like my my guy. When you look at Subaru, you see Kudo Kun, and you look at Kudo Kun, you don't see Subaru because you don't know who that is because you don't watch Detective Conan because you're a rube. I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. That was rude. Um, but basically, this is an ex it, it's an established person, <laughs> you know. Um, I I don't know. I got to a point where I realized that it's almost, it's a, it's a little bit cringe to not have an avatar representing you that is actually you. There's something weird about having like an established character taken from a well-known IP and using that as like, that's, that's me, that's my character, he represents me. And that's, that's kind of been a problem since day one because if you don't know, Subaru was never supposed to be my channel mascot. Basically, I was looking for an icon, and I wanted something Detective Conan related, because I'm a big Detective Conan guy. Um, and I saw him sitting on, like, a pile of books, and I thought it was a really cute picture, and I used that as my image. And then that just became, like, oh, that's Kudo-kun. That's Kudo-kun sitting on those books. I don't know who Subaru is. That's Kudo-kun. And it was this perfect mix of people not knowing who the character was and uh, that character getting so closely associated with me that people, you know, came to know that as being me. And, you know, I know I'll never be big enough to have, like, merchandise or, like, a U2's figure. But one of those, one of the things that you think about a lot as a content creator is 
like what if one day i had a u2s figure one what if one day u2s reached out to me and said hey you know what we decided we want to we want to make a, a figurine out of you like how would you like us to model it like what am i what am i gonna do am i gonna show them pictures of subaru and have them <laughs> and have them make a u2s figure out of it that's not only would that just not work but uh, it's just a really difficult thing to, to struggle with and to strap with is that this isn't mine. It's not me and I didn't create it. And it's not Kudo-kun, it's Subaru. Um, I like some of the aesthetic things around it. I've even played around a little bit with, you know, creating a new avatar that looks very similar. And if I remember during the editing process, I'll put up an image or something of that so that you guys can see what I'm talking about. But even if I make something very similar, but is different, I always have to internally struggle with the fact that it's not me and it's not mine. Whereas the new avatar, even though people don't like it as much, is mine. I created it. It is a me thing. You know, that's as much as people don't like it as much as they like Subaru because they're so connected to Subaru. It The fact that it belongs to me is just, it's so... It feels so good to have something like that. You know, if I wanted to make like a t-shirt in the future, for example, um, I could put this guy, I can't put Subaru on a bunch of t-shirts, you know, that's going to get me in trouble eventually. So yeah, I don't know. Um, now, I've said all of that to say this. Um, if you don't know, basically, I uh, the person who made the image that I use in all of my thumbnails um, it was a very close friend of mine. In fact, we were so close that we dated. <laughs> and then, you know, even after the relationship ended, we stayed really, really good friends. She was one of the few people who could connect with me on the stuff that I really liked. And um, she unfortunately did pass away a few years ago. And I've been holding on to that image as sort of like, like that was the last thing that she ever really gave me. You know, she was a commission artist and that was sort of her last memento to me is that image. So I still try and use it as my Kudo-kun thing. Um, and of course, that's, that's a problem if I'm trying to move on to a new image. Because, you know, uh, even if I wanted to continue using her work, you know, she's gone now. I can't just ask her to make another thumbnail image of my new character. So um, I've been thinking of how I'm going to handle that. And I don't know fully yet, but there is a chance that maybe what I'll do is I'll keep Subaru here. And here when I'm Kudo-kun, <laughs> you know, I use Subaru stuff. I do like some, some aspects of him. I like the closed eyes, the sort of Brock style eyes. I think that's a really cute feature and I really like using that for some of my stuff. Um, so maybe keep that aesthetic here and then move on to Senpai or Sammy Senpai with the new avatar and have that be like my Sammy Senpai avatar. Um, I think that would probably work okay because I want to try and keep the two somewhat separated. Like if people, if I go on Sammy Senpai and I uh, make videos and people find out about my Kudokun content and they come here. I'm not worried about it. You know, so I'm not trying to hide part of my identity from the internet, but you know, there's there's a ton of stuff on like here I can be a lot more candid about some of my interests. Like for example, like Senran Kagura, like what am I gonna do? <laughs> Go on to a professional like Japanese teaching thing, talk about how much I love Senran Kagura. <laughs> like, like that's not gonna happen. Uh, if anything, I think I'm the person in the card game community who has said the phrase anime titties more than like any other YouTuber. So if I can just give myself a quick pat on the back for that one, that's like my, <laughs> that's my thing is I've said anime titties more than anybody else that you've ever heard. Um, Like, you know, if obviously if I want to talk about stuff like that, I don't really want that to be on a professional channel. Not yet, at least, you know, <laughs> or maybe not until I'm way more established. So Trying to keep these two things separate is, you know, something that I'm, uh, I'm 
conscious of the fact that I need to do that. And, you know, maybe, you know, since people aren't super hot on the new Kudo Kun avatar, maybe I take my actual avatar, push it over to Sammy Senpai, and then over here, just keep using Subaru. You guys are already familiar with him. It makes you guys happy. Just do that. Have that be the compromise there. It's not a guarantee. I don't know if I'm going to do that yet, but it could be what I end up doing. Okay. I think that's about all the stuff I need to say for the channel. Um, so if you're just here for channel stuff, that's basically where it's going to end. I'm going to even one more reminder that, you know, your, your boy Kudokun doesn't ask for much. If you could just, you know, go down to the description and click on his link and sign up for this brand new game and get into it, you know, that'd be really cool of you. If not, I understand. Um, but uh, I think we're going to go ahead and move on to the final section, which is going to be sort of me updating you guys on everything that happened after the move to Arizona. Okay, so let's get into it. So I ended up moving down here to Arizona with my girlfriend. Uh, she needed to come here for ASU because that was the next leg of her uh, college journey. And I'm kind of just following her around, you know, uh, <laughs> being her accessory boyfriend. And uh, I ended up getting a job at a school as a, basically a special needs teacher, right? Um, basically, in order to be a, an actual teacher, <laughs> like you have to have certifications and stuff, but to just help uh, kids with special needs, you don't really need any of that stuff. So I ended up getting a job at a local school. I was very proud of that job. I was very happy with it. And I, as like a side gig... Um, they even let me do like an after school Japanese program. So that was great. You know, that's going to be on my resume forever. I loved doing it. Um, I got to meet my girlfriend's family. They are super cool, nerdy people, just like I am. Um, it's been a real joy getting to know them. Obviously, we don't talk as much as I would like, uh, considering how many, you know, the same interests we have. It's, what, it's always one of those really difficult things when like you have people in your life that like the same stuff as you but you never really get a chance to enjoy that stuff with them so you know <laughs> it's it's whatever i'm really happy i got to meet them i'm really happy to have them in my life and it's always a joy when i get to see them um also my girlfriend joined a board game club and i became very good friends with the people there um again this is one of those things where we've got a lot of the same interests you know whenever there's a meme about board games that pops up i love to share it in discord with them and it's a lot of fun having them in my life, but we don't really get to connect as much as I would like. So still kind of uh, still kind of all alone in that area, but that's okay. I have some people in my life that, you know, if a big event comes up, you know, just this last year, um, we had a New Year's party where, uh, no, wait a second. No, I'm sorry. It wasn't New Year's. It was a 4th of July party. We had a 4th of July party where we all got together and played some board games together. And that was uh, a hoot. It was a lot of fun. So then a little bit into my life at, you know, this school, uh, COVID hits. <laughs> that was that was fun. Uh, I worked at a public school during the entire COVID crisis, which, believe you me, I've got some stories to tell <laughs> about that. And when I go to the other, you know, the Senpai channel, uh, I'm going to be making so many videos about all the weird stuff that happened as a teacher during COVID. When it first started, they had us stay home and we basically did everything from Zoom on our computers. Then it eventually got to a point where we needed to come in and you know talk to the kids that we were teaching. So it was like, it was classrooms full of like 10 kids at a time because they were doing this like on and off schedule where like two days you would come to school and then you you would be off of school for the next three days um and then eventually things got more serious and they stopped doing that as well and uh basically the way it worked is it was like a babysitting job where they had me and then like a couple of other people who were also in the special needs area come in and go into a classroom with all the kids that needed to be at school because maybe they're both of their parents worked or they just didn't have other accommodations and it was basically me watching over them so during this time I made friends with a teacher there who I will not name 
because um, <laughs> I hate her and <laughs> I don't want uh, anybody, I don't want any weird stuff happening because I said her name in a YouTube video. We'll call her, we'll call her Mrs. C. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and you can, you know what, if you feel like replacing the C with anything else, go for it. I'm certainly not going to stop you, but we'll just say Mrs. C for right now. So I made really good friends with her at the time. And it was uh, an interesting, <laughs> it was an interesting time in my career, because um, of how just weirdly handled public schools were. Here's one of my favorite stories from the time, and I'll go into more detail about this later. But for right now, I'll give you the short version. So, when it came to the school breakfasts, basically, when you come into school, you get yourself a little tray of breakfast stuff, usually. But here, what they did is they sent, like, tote bags of stuff, and they told us how to proportion it for each kid. And um, they told us at the time, and I am not making this up, that any of the food that the kids didn't eat needed to be thrown in the trash now, I know this sounds reasonable, but keep in mind that we adults were taking the precautions we needed to hand this food out to the kids. It was not very much food. It was like a box of raisins, a piece of fruit, and a muffin. <laughs> Most of the time was like the entire meal. Not very much food at all. Um, and they would give us enough food for like 10 kids, even if we only had six kids. So... I feel like any any sane person would realize, okay, as long as the food is being handled by an adult who is taking the proper safety measures, just give this food out to the kids who want it, right? You know, if there's a really hungry kid, give him two muffins. You know, if at the end of it you have leftover food, uh, divvy the food up and see if anybody else wants the food. Let these kids have as much food as they want if that food is made available to them. This was not the case. They wanted us to throw it away. So needless to say, we didn't follow that rule at all. The way we did it is we made sure each of the kids got whatever their breakfast was um, if the kids were touching the food and they didn't want that food anymore, that food got thrown away because we can't just let them spread their germs during this COVID stuff. But uh, we would then take all the food that wasn't given out. We would put it on a desk. And then if the kids got hungry later in the day or if the kids were just really hungry during breakfast, we would distribute that food to them. And then we would just mark on the paper that we were following all the guidelines and like giving the, the kids the right amount of food. Um, another thing that was really ridiculous about this is there were usually three adults uh, in a classroom at once. And you would think that with all this extra food, <laughs> they would let us, the teachers, you know, get a, a breakfast as well if the kids were already fed. But that wasn't the case. There was one adult's breakfast, which I say adult in air quotes because it wasn't actually an adult breakfast. It was the same breakfast the kids were getting. It was just like one extra for the adult in the room. But if there were three of us, we didn't get three adults food uh breakfast we got just one adult breakfast that we had to spread spread between the three of us like how are we even going to do that <laughs> one person gets the muffin one person gets a piece of fruit and one person gets the box of raisins that's that's dumb it is the stupidest thing i've ever heard obviously after all the kids ate their stuff if nobody else wanted the extra food obviously we just ate the food ourselves we're not throwing the food in the trash that's such a stupid thing that they tried to enforce on us so I digress. There's all kinds of little stories that I have about uh, that experience that I'll be sharing at another, <laughs> at another time on the Senpai channel. But for right now, let's go ahead and continue here. Basically, uh, my work life gets a bit complicated because this teacher, somebody got it in her head that I was trying to take over her classroom. When we first started, you know, she was still a brand new teacher. She was younger than me. She was 20 years old when she started there, yet she outranked me, you know. But anyways, uh, she was 20 years old when she started there. I was a few years older than her. And 
she could like she she was like the coolest person in the beginning right she worked with me on some stuff like she asked me oh hey i don't just want you in the classroom i want you to contribute some stuff you should contribute some stuff we should work together to create some stuff like you know japanese stuff right like maybe we can come up with some cool like japanese themed reading lessons that we can give these kids and i was like yes that sounds fantastic i would love to do that for you and we would do that and it was great. And then again, somebody later on got it in her head that I was trying to take her class from her, which is so, where do I even begin? I was getting paid half of what she was getting paid. Obviously, I didn't want the uh, to do my job and also her job at the same time. I didn't get, I, there's nothing to gain from me supposedly taking over her classroom. I don't even know what that means. To this day, I still don't know what she could possibly mean by that. But somebody got in her head that that's what I was trying to do. So she confronted me about it and straight up told me, like, hey, like, you know, I'm going to make working here really difficult for you because you've been, uh, you know, trying to take over my stuff. She she confronted me about this, you know, in the same in, in the same energy that, like, obviously uh, a 20 year old with way too much power would. I can't blame her for that. Like, she's 20 and she has the power to supposedly make the life of somebody who has wronged her. Um, much more difficult of course she's going to abuse that power and the fact that she was so flagrantly saying that she was going to do it you know like it's it's one of those things that only somebody who is 20 years old can really do <laughs> though i think anybody 21 and older would be smart enough to not do it but she did it and she got away with it man she uh, she tried to make things more difficult on me and then another person she had power over first because she gave us like these giant binders full of paper and she was like, well, from now on, I want you to start recording all of your interactions here and I want you to make detailed lists on all of this stuff that your students are doing. And she did this to us as a punishment and she had no idea who I am right she has no idea how autistic i can be when it comes to keeping detailed notes on something when i got into dofus i created a detailed list of every single enemy i would have to fight in order to complete all of the quests and do everything in the most calculated perfect order possible when i got into board games i went into my little online circles and i created a detailed spreadsheet of every single board game i had ever encountered and could ever play and i even created entire just lists of things about them what are their board game ratings on boardgamegeek.com what give me a review for every single game on my list how many players what's the runtime what's the difficulty level she had no idea who she was messing with right so i did it i made the most beautiful immaculate little lists of everything that was going on in my student's life and eventually when she realized that that wasn't a punishment that that was giving me the most amount of power she could possibly give she was giving up so much by sh giving me the opportunity to shine as the best possible aid um she she stopped doing that um and she came up with some some stupid reason for it, but I would have loved it if that had continued forever. She literally had no idea who she was messing with when she did that. I digress. Um, so she ended up stopping that. And then there came a point where we had a meeting. It was me, her, and the principal. I will never forget this meeting as long as I live. The principal, for whatever reason just he didn't really like me either it's one of those really difficult situations where the students i'm working with love me um a lot of the teachers love me most of the faculty loves me but there are these two people with an enormous amount of power over me that don't like me so we get into this meeting and we have a talk about it and i again i will never forget this meeting because Mrs. C says the most insane thing to me that I have ever heard somebody get away with saying to me. And I'll admit to this day, it still makes me upset somewhere in my core. 
she said to me in front of the principal, okay, sure, I took advantage of you, but you let me take advantage of you, and that's on you. <laughs> what an insanely... I can't, I can't even believe that's such an abusive, awful thing to say to somebody and to say it with the conviction like you just said something. You know what I mean? And the principal, the big, dumb principal is sitting there nodding along as she's saying this, like she's spitting facts over here. And it's it's so insane to me that somebody got away with saying that to me in front of the only person who could have helped me out of that situation um yeah i still think about that i still think about that moment sometimes it still upsets me to this day i, I never let go of it like dang how could how could you say that to somebody <laughs> right and again it's such a tough situation because she's 20 obviously she's gonna be a, a giant dum dum. <laughs> like I can't expect her to act farther than her age allows her to act. You know what I mean? Like that. That's one of those things that I think when you hit thirty, you you start to understand better. You can't expect somebody to act further than their age allows them to act, and that's really the only thing I can say there. But that was like my my light bulb moment that I needed to get out of this place. So what I did is I spent the next few months really, really, really grinding into a way that I could continue to teach, but teach on a professional scale. You know, I had missed my chance at college. I had missed my chance getting like a, a bachelor's degree, a teaching degree. It was just, it's too late in my life for that to happen. It's not going to mesh with the kind of relationship I want with my girlfriend, um, who will eventually become my wife. You know, that's not the, that doesn't, coincide with the kind of life that I want for myself. So I needed to find a way to teach in a way that makes money. <laughs> but uh, that's, you know, it was difficult, but I did it. You know, there was a, a website called OutSchool. And I spent all of my free time between that meeting and the time that I eventually left, I spent all of it researching out school. I knew this is the place that I was going to be. Um, I basically spent the rest of my year there at the school that I was working at. And then when I left, I had everything in place. I knew all of the stuff I wanted to teach. I, uh, I had made uh, classes for everything I wanted to do. I had done all the research I needed to know like uh, what I needed each lesson to include, what my pricing was going to look like. I had everything ready. And you know what? I hit out school like a truck. I became the most prominent Japanese teacher on that platform. Within the few months that I worked there, I was able to maintain 500 students. I had a near perfect five star rating out of five, if that wasn't clear. Um, I was fantastic. I was able to reach out and do some math classes. I did some video game design classes. My classes got so big that they started using my classes as their advertising material for a little while, right? It was the most growth I think anybody within my space has had like in such a short amount of time. Cause seriously, I, I started in July and then by the time December hit, I was up to making over $3,000 a month. And I was well on my way to making $4,000 a month. If they had let me continue on the website, you know what? I could have been making insane amounts of money. But, you know, by the way I phrase that, you can probably tell what's coming. Let's go ahead and get into it. Uh, I, st I started teaching on OutSchool. It was the best experience of my entire life. That was, that was peak nirvana. Just that was the, the, the peak of my entire life so far, right? It was the highest up that I've ever had. I was making way more than I did at any other job that I've ever had. I was living a fairly nice lifestyle. And you know what? I'm not, I'm not sorry for it. <laughs> you know, I, uh, when I was living in Fullerton, 
a lot of bad stuff happened. I lost my absolute best friend in the entire world, uh, just, you know, to a woman, basically. Um, he made my life difficult. I paid $500 a month to live in a stranger's garage. <laughs> I, uh, I was homeless for a very, very long time. During that homelessness, somebody walked away with my one passion, you know, walked away with my gaming bag that had all the games that I had collected during my time being homeless with my Vita and my 3DS, basically my entire video game collection I had at the time. Somebody got that bag and just walked away with it. In I want to stress also the bag was a Christmas gift that I really enjoyed from my girlfriend's family. So that also hurt. Uh, I had pins attached to that bag that, you know, I'll never get back. Um, that was a very difficult time in my life. And after going through all of that, after getting a hold of yet another job that I was super successful in and then having somebody just spit in my face and make me feel awful, make me feel worthless, getting this job, it really made me feel vindicated. Like I am worth everything that I thought I was worth. So I lived it. And my plan was to continue living it until the next year you know this year just this last few months of the year i'm going to just live the life that i want to live and then next year we'll start making the bigger plans we'll start setting some money aside for uh the uh, trip to japan we'll start setting some money aside for retirement we'll start all of that stuff next year because i ain't going anywhere okay fade to black <laughs> and uh Next year, there was a project that I got, uh, I very graciously offered. It was like a teaching thing where we were going to work with a school and we were going to teach like official classes, like an actual teacher. We we're going to teach actual classes for the school and we were getting paid peanuts for it, you know, in the long run. Um, I think it was like, I got like $10,000 to do an entire year of teaching, which for me is fantastic, but Obviously, if you went to like an actual teacher and you told them you're going to pay them $10,000 a year, they would they would be upset about it. But we were hyped about it. That was that was such good money at the time. And um, they gave it to us. And uh, yeah, like I, I paid off all of my debts. I was completely debt free. Um, you know, I had to take some, some money out when I had first moved to Arizona. I was able to pay all of that off. I was able to pay off all my old like credit card stuff. I was able to get out of pretty much all the debt that I ever had. Um, I, I ended up even getting this computer that I'm using right now. It's like a really, really nice computer at the time. So, um, I did all of this and the, the expectations for the class were a little bit weird. Um, I asked them what I, they wanted me to focus on, if they wanted me to focus on reading and writing, or if they wanted me to focus on like listening ability, conversational ability. And they were super vague, which should have been my first red flag, if I'm being completely honest. They were very, very vague about what they actually wanted. So they just said that they wanted everything. You know, just, just oh, no, just do everything. I saw, we just want everything in the class, which, you know, you know, you flash all this money in front of my face, you... You, uh, you get me in this time where I'm, I'm just so emotionally like into myself. And uh, of course, I'm not going to think through it rationally. And I didn't. <laughs> um, I came up with, I actually, I'm actually very proud of what I came up with. I came up with a class that I thought would have been fantastic. Um, basically, it was a project-based class. So every, every few months... They wanted us to also have like a project that would be completed associated with this class. And I think I hit the nail on the head. The first part of the class was going to be just learning the writing system and learning how to very basically say things that you like and things that you don't like. Basically just give very basic opinions. I like this. I don't like this. So on and so forth. Um, and then we were going to turn that into a movie review. I was going to, I told them to pick an animated movie 
and you know basically just make a review on it and they kept coming to me like oh but i don't know how to say this particular word or uh how do i say a uh, uh, beautiful landscapes and i was like if you don't know how to say it just work around it it's totally fine that's the thing you know the entire point of the assignment is when you don't know how to say everything you want to say learn how to scale back and get your point across using simpler language. It's one of the things that people struggle with the most when it comes to learning Japanese is they can't say the exact thing that they want to say or like there's a, a specific word that they would normally use in English that they can't use in Japanese and it completely derails their entire line of thought in Japanese. So, you know, this thing, you know, if you cannot say the thing you want to say, you need to find a way to scale it back into something similar. Learn how to say instead of, um, uh, I think this character uh, fits my personality beautifully with their elegant ways. Like, learn how to scale that back into, I like this character. Here are some, like, this character is cool. I like this character. Like, so it's very simple stuff. That was going to be the first part. And then during the second part, we were going to uh, go into, you know, learning the second alphabet in Japanese. In Japanese, you have to learn three alphabets technically, only, technically two alphabets, but then like one set of characters afterwards. Um, we were going to turn that into a um, like an interview thing where I taught everybody how to ask and answer questions. So instead of just saying that you like something, here's how to ask other people what they like or ask other people if they like something and you know i think that's a pretty logical place to take that you know you take you start with something very small i like this i don't like this transition that into a way to open up to other people do you like this or i like this how do you feel about this do you also like this um and then like the project for that was going to be like a small interview where basically each student would come up with like a, se a series of small questions like uh, which food do you like, what color do you like, so on and so forth. And then, you know, they'd be able to ask and answer those questions amongst each other. It was going to be very, very simple. And then during the third part, um, I was going to have ev have everybody at that point, you know, their reading and writing ability would have been decent enough that they could write a paragraph. And I was going to have them each you know, write a little paragraph that would be in the form of like an article, like pick a topic, like articles, sports, beauty and healthcare, whatever. I will help you guys come up with some words that you can use for this article. We're going to get into sentence structure and how to make slightly um, more coherent sentences. Still nothing crazy, obviously, but, you know, we're going to uh, do this thing where you um, are able to write like a paragraph, like about a specific topic, and it's going to be really cool. And then, you know, during our final section, we were going to go back to the movie reviews and that would be the time where we would take everything we've, everything that we've learned, everything that we've um, sort of gathered, and we were going to fluff up those uh, reviews and redo them to show the progress the students have made during that year of learning Japanese. <sighs> like, I don't want to, I'm just going to give myself another pat on the back here. I think it would have been an amazing year, but here's the problem. The students that I got um, could not, I want to say they couldn't handle doing everything at once, right? <laughs> so the first section was basically just learning the basic alphabet and like and dislike something, right? <sighs> they, they were very difficult to work with, let me just say that. <laughs> um, uh, here's, here's the thing, let me give sort of a, a demonstration here. The average time it takes a Japanese learner to learn the first basic alphabet is two weeks, okay? It takes two weeks to learn the first basic alphabet. These students still didn't know the first basic alphabet after three months. <laughs> three months we went over the first basic alphabet and there were still students in the class who couldn't even hit 50% of them. That is really pathetic. Like, obviously, if you don't know it within the first month, there, there are things you could attribute to that, right? 
maybe they had a huge workload or whatever in their other classes. We we can explain that away. But after three months, you didn't... <laughs> it's Okay, let me explain who I am as a teacher. I understand the world that we currently live in. So when you come to me and you say you don't understand something in class... I am going to ask you specific questions about what you don't understand. And then if next week you still don't understand it, I am going to ask you why you did not contact me to let me know. And if you hit me with an I don't know, then I'm going to tell you, okay, I'm going to explain it again. If you have more questions about this next week, please let me know. Then next week rolls around. Three weeks in, you still don't know this concept. I am going to call you out and ask you, okay, can you please show me some of the YouTube videos you've watched on this concept? Can you show me some of the things you've Googled to try and figure this concept out? I'll walk you through some of the articles you read, and we'll see if we can figure this out together. Right? I, I'm going to check my email because it's possible that maybe... I didn't get the email that you clearly sent me about this topic, right? And I go through and I'm like, okay, well, there's no, there's no email here. So can you please send me a link to some of the, uh, the web searches you've done or some of the YouTube videos that you've watched and maybe I can go through it and explain it better? Oh, I didn't, I didn't look it up on YouTube. Oh, I didn't look it up on Google. Okay. Well, I've explained it to you three times. You haven't reached out to me at all. You haven't done any kind of internet research on it. How am I supposed to take that as you are genuinely trying to learn this concept, right? And I, I know there's going to be some knee-jerk reactions out there. Oh, well, that's well, that's just not fair. Kuro-kun is such a bad teacher. Why would you not just explain it again? Some students need it explained to them multiple times. Uh... When you've been teaching for as long as I have, you can start to sort of weed out the difference between students who just aren't getting the concept because if they just say they I they, they just say I don't know long enough, then they never have to take responsibility for not learning a thing, and students who are genuinely trying to understand a concept. You start to learn the differences there. Kids are going to be kids, and I hate that we have to stop acknowledging that kids are just kids when it comes to education. Of course, kids are going to get bored in class. Of course, of course, kids are going to not take certain uh, things seriously. And when kids are confronted with difficulty, they are sometimes not going to handle that difficulty well, and they are going to back into a corner. Um, it's just kind of the way things are. Even the most successful teachers, even the best teachers on the entire planet cannot have a 100% success rate in teaching a concept because some kids are just not ready for that yet. Um, these kids that I taught were not ready for that yet. Three months on a two-week concept where they didn't try anything outside of class. When the end of that first section came up, I failed 70% of the class on the ending exam that I had planned. Uh, I gave them the test. They couldn't do it. I failed them as it should be. However, I learned a little bit, uh, a little bit later, I should say, that that is uh, somewhat frowned upon. <laughs> that you, that even if a kid deserves to fail, you probably shouldn't fail them because um, it's it's a bad mark on the school itself. So. I've got some opinions about the way schools work. <laughs> uh, that is definitely one of the things that I do not like about the school system is you have to be a little bit uh, disingenuine, disingenuous, I should say, disingenuous when it comes to grading students' actual performance because you have to weigh the students' bad performance against how badly it's going to reflect on the school. So, of course, I did this. I failed most of the class because you know what i'm just going to come out and say it because they failed because they deserved what they got they deserved their scores they did nothing outside of class during those three months to try and learn the very basic concept that i was teaching them at the beginning of the year they didn't reach out to me for extra help 
they they did not do what I expected of them, and I expected very little of them. So I felt completely fine in doing it. Now, of course, the plan from there was, okay, during the second part, we're going to go back and we're going to figure out how to get you caught up or get this fixed. And hopefully, after failing this, after seeing that I am not going to give you a free pass, let's work together to get you fixed up for the next section. However, <laughs> I guess that was a lot more serious than uh, I initially thought because that school um, talked to out school and out school ended up dropping me over this happening. Um, this came as a huge shock. You know, I, of course, my home out school, the place that I think that I flourished the most ended up uh, separating from me and of course that school ended up separating from me as well because they were separating with me throughout school um that was sort of the downward spiral <laughs> um not only had i lost the best job that i'd ever had i lost it at a time where i wasn't prepared to lose it um and i i lost it at that it, for something that I still, to this day, I feel like it was unfairly taken from me. I feel like I was kicked out of a place that I deserve to be in pretty unfairly, you know? Um, it's really difficult to, it's really difficult to go through those feelings because the students love me. I, I'm maintaining 500 unique students. I, um, I'm working for a, a rate that is much lower than like my expectations like if you bring in an actual teacher they're going to want four times the amount of money that I want but I'm willing to do it out of love I love this I loved I loved doing the job I loved the students that I worked with you know and I was okay getting paid in that love uh, over the amount of money that I was actually making. Not only was that taken from me, but the job that I had before then was also taken from me. And, you know, get hit with a lot of negative emotions from that. Because <laughs> not only did I lose all of this great stuff that I had now, but it was almost like all of those, you know, all those negative things that I've ever been told about me uh, not being worth anything, about me being this awful person, about me, uh, you know, about me not succeeding, sort of pile on top of me too. And I'll admit, that was depressing. <laughs> I didn't really do very much after that. But I, I kept on. Um, I ended up signing up for some other websites. Uh, I ended up working for Preply all school instead of out school fluent city a, a ton a ton basically every single website i could sign up for and teach for i i did um and you know i made some money i was able to uh still pitch in for my part of the rent for example so on and so forth but eventually uh my girlfriend did end up moving out and i ended up staying in the apartment by myself um, I should also mention during this time, holy cow, I can't believe I forgot this. Uh, we ended up getting a cat. <laughs> like there was a cat who showed up at our door and I am pretty firmly against pets. I don't really want to live with animals. Um, I grew up living with animals. It, it basically ruins uh, a lot of stuff in my life. Um, I couldn't have friends over because the entire place smelled like uh, pee <laughs> and it was just a very unclean, unhealthy, unsanitary place to live. My parents were um, my parents were too old to really keep the place as clean as it needed to be for a place with as many animals as we lived with. They didn't really have the energy to get all of the animals fixed, for example. So the animals just kept breeding within, within themselves. So we ended up at one point having 23 cats that we lived with, and it was hell. <laughs> I did not like that time. That was not a good time in my life. Um, so since then, I've been pretty firmly against having pets. But <sighs> this cat, it showed up on our doorstep meowing as though it already lived there. And then 
you know, we ended up giving it tuna because I would keep tuna around the house just as a snack. And I ended up feeding it some tuna and it just, it just never left. <sighs> so we still technically kind of have it. It lives with the girlfriends now. She named it Bean, uh, supposedly because when it laid, um, it lays in this way, like a boomerang shape. And so she named it Bean because it looks like a giant bean when it's laying down, supposedly. Um, she got very attached to it and ended up showing up for some of my classes. Uh, my students very much liked him. Um, I called him Teaching Assistant Bean. So he was my little teaching assistant. He would hang out with me during uh, some of my uh, classes that I was teaching. So, yeah, that that made things kind of difficult, too, because when she moved out initially, I also had to take care of this cat. <laughs> so some of the money that would have been going towards rent and me feeding myself was going towards taking care of the cat's needs as well, buying litter, buying food, you know, that kind of stuff. I got really into board games at that time. Um well, for the most part, I wasn't doing very much, right? I was, uh, I'll just fully admit it, you know, I, I was completely, I was depressed. I, uh, I wasn't handling life very well at that time because it really did feel like I had blown the one opportunity I had to make something of myself. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's a bit of a dour note. Uh then unfortunately things aren't going to get much better. <laughs> so from that point, um, my girlfriend had moved out and she was, you know, getting her college life ready. And we had figured out by the time she moved out that it would actually be cheaper to keep this apartment, which was um, with all the bills and stuff included. It was $1,400 a month and her dormitory, which was $900 a month. Um, you know, came out to $2,300 a month. It was actually $2,500 a month or over to live in the area where she was in like a one bedroom apartment. So instead of that, you know, we, we just decided to do the cheaper option. I would live here. She would live there. And um, <sighs> one thing about my girlfriends, if you don't know this about our relationship already, she's kind of the man in our relationship. Um, when we first got together, that was the decision that we made for how our relationship was going to work. I was going to be the housewife, you know, take care of the, the cooking, take care of the shopping, take care of basically stuff around the house. And then if I can make some money from home, that's what I'll do as well um, to help out with bills and stuff. And then she's the one who's going to go off and get like a really nice, uh, you know, career. That's what she's on track to. She's been in school for like 14 years now, just doing college stuff. So obviously at the end of it, that's going to go towards her getting a nice career for herself and, you know, making more money than usual and being sort of the head of the house. Um, and that's what she knew she wanted when she was 20. And that's what she still wants to this day. But, um, you know, she was living her part of, the rent would have been, you know, she was paying for her stuff, obviously. And then she agreed to help me out by paying half of the rent here. So she was paying $700 um, towards this apartment as well. And now I'll fully admit, you know, my teaching didn't always go the way I wanted it to. Um, I found very cheap ways to feed myself. I was able to eat on like 2 to $3 a day. I, uh, I figured it out. I got it all set up. I was still eating okay, uh, just at a very cheap rate. Wasn't eating the highest quality food, obviously. Um, but, you know, I was getting it done. And, you know, there were some times where uh, even despite doing that, I had to lean on her a little bit. And instead of $700 a month, she would end up paying as much as like $1,000 a month. Um, it was a huge... <laughs> Huge spike from where we were, where I was paying for all of our food, where I took on our rent and I started paying our rent. Um, I got all of the debts and bills and stuff paid off. And then I became like the main breadwinner for a little while. Um, and then, you know, flip back to our original script where she was the one who was primarily taking care of the stuff financially and I was putting in everything I could. Um, and there came a point where 
we were talking to each other and I could tell that this situation was putting some stress on her. She, um, I don't, this is one of those things where like somebody says something that hurts a lot and you know, they didn't say it intentionally to hurt your feelings. And in most situations, it's something that probably shouldn't hurt your feelings at all. But, um, she told me while we were talking, like we were getting into a bit of an argument over the situation. Cause I think this is one of the months where I needed the thousand instead of the 700 and like she got really angry and she was like, well, I, I don't know why I'm even paying this. You know, I'm not even living there. And it was one of those things like, like it hit me because it was, I had always kind of taken the sort of like uh, tongue in cheek nature of the way that our living situation was working, right? Yeah, even under our, our normal situation, you know, she was putting in, you know, $1,600 a month. Um, she was making a lot more money than me. She had a lot more money saved up financially. She was just like the person, the breadwinner in our relationship. So, you know, I was, I was coming off of like this e extremely just insane amounts of you know, negativity from everything that had happened recently. And I thought that we kind of both in the back of our minds knew that she was the one putting more into this, but that she was also doing it sort of for my benefit because it was something that I really needed. And um, when she hit me with that, it made me realize that she was starting to resent me a little bit for uh, how much financially she was having to uh, cover for me. Um, I didn't feel, I didn't feel super good. Um, I don't think, I don't think she really realized it at the time, like I said before, but, uh, that it really hurt a lot to hear. So I made the decision that, if I want the relationship to work, I was going to need to find a way to take that burden off of her. So I had already been homeless before, and I decided that I could just become homeless again and um, just be homeless until we could figure out a way to live together again and be together again. So that's what I did. I, um, I let her know that I wasn't going to renew the apartment I was just gonna be homeless and um, when we first talked about it um, she sounded a bit relieved she was very happy about this decision and originally she was going to you know try and help me out a little bit financially still by putting in a little bit of money to, to help me through the homelessness and um, she ended up coming down that summer. Uh, we took all of my stuff and then some of her stuff and put it into a storage unit. And then, you know, the plan was to just figure everything out from there. So uh, we did. And then uh, she never, I never, we never really worked out anything for her to help me out financially. So um, I realized that there was, a, there was a bit of a crossroads, right? So. In order for me to continue my dream of just teaching, you know, doing this thing that I really enjoy, um, I was going to need to either focus on that and continue doing it, you know, live a much lower life. But hey, now that I don't have to worry about uh, bills and stuff, you know, I, I just have to worry about paying the storage and then like some other expenses that I'll talk about later. Um, I could just continue to teach and, you know, sort of scrape by just doing that. And I get to do what I love. I get to dedicate the remaining time to uh, some other passions and stuff. And um, I could do that. Or I could give up all of the teaching and stuff. I could get a, um, a minimum wage job somewhere. And, you know, I could just sort of do it that way. Um, and then I realized, oh, dang. <laughs> I never actually bothered to get myself a new ID and I can't get a job without an ID. 
So uh, I decided to start going after a new ID while I was homeless. And um, here's how the homelessness thing planned out. So I had the storage unit, which is basically where I kept all my stuff. Um, I didn't really hang out in there or anything. Uh, the, the thing about living in a storage unit is uh, most storage units are aware of that that is a grift that happens and you know they don't really let that happen so i didn't really um i didn't really do that uh here here's how everything worked out there's a lot of moving parts here but i'll try and keep it as simple as possible so every morning um when i woke up i would go to the storage unit and i would get my work equipment and then i would walk to a nearby panera um, this Panera, I ended up becoming really good friends with some people who worked there, um, people that I really need to reach out to again and let them know that everything's uh, kind of okay, because there were, there were some people there, they were, were, they were really sweet. Um, There's one girl there, uh, I don't want to say her name, I'll just call her Panera Girl, because that's kind of what I call her with my girlfriend. Um, this girl, Panera Girl, really cute, uh, you know, young, super bubbly personality. She took care of me while I was there. Like, she, she snuck me free cookies whenever she could because she knew my situation. Um, just an amazing person. I, I'm, so, I'm so happy for her that she finally got out of there and she's working, like, an actual job now. She's, like, an assistant manager at, like, a jewelry shop, which is just so cool for her. I, I really like that that happened. Um, but basically, I would walk to Panera, and I would spend uh, the first part of my morning at Panera. They have this deal there where if you pay, like, $13 a month. They have, like, Netflix, but for drinks. So if you pay $13 a month, you can just drink as much stuff as you want, coffee, teas, uh, sodas, so on and so forth. Um, so I would do that for the first part of the uh, morning. And then there was a library about a 20-minute walk away, so I would walk to the library. And I would spend the majority of my day uh, there at the library. Um, the only times I would come back out of the library is when I would go back to Panera to teach classes. And I think that's one of the reasons they, um, they were so cool with me at Panera was because I was teaching and they thought that was really interesting. So, you know, they just let me use that as like my, my home, my base of operations, because I was working from there as well. So sort of bouncing back and forth between Panera and the library is how I lived my life during uh, this stretch of homelessness. And then I was also paying for a gym membership so that I could keep myself bathed and groomed. And, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to inflict too much of myself on, on these places. So I tried to make sure that, you know, I was sneaking back into, <laughs> I was sneaking back into the apartment complex to do my laundry and, you know, as long as I played it super cool, people were pretty okay with me there. I wasn't supposed to be there at all. And if I had run into anybody who actually managed the apartments, I'm pretty sure they would have called the police or kicked me out or something. Never came to that, though. Um, so I would spend most of my day at uh, the library, and then I would go back to Panera once the library closed. I would spend the rest of my day there. And then um, I would walk back to the storage locker before everything closed down i would walk back to the storage unit and i'll put all of my work stuff in all of my valuables in just keep my phone on me and maybe like a small game system like a 3ds or my psp or something and then i would go out and find a place to sleep um this started out being a bus stop um it was a bus stop for a pretty long time actually and then um they <laughs> I'm not joking about this. They ended up tearing down that bus stop <laughs> while I was homeless. And I am like 80 to 90% sure it was literally just because I was sleeping there. <laughs> it's one of the funniest things, man. Like I, I'm pretty, like I've never had that much uh, impact on like a, a place ever. And I'm pretty sure the most impact I've ever had on a place is they tore down a bus stop just to stop me from sleeping there. I ended up finding a different spot. It was kind of neat. It was like a, it was actually really cool. It was like a, a like slanted sloped like bit of concrete. And you know, it was in the, this area with like a bunch of bushes and stuff. And I thought it was kind of cool. So I ended up uh, taking that spot over and you know, I was dealing with some stuff like rain. I love the rain. The rain is, I, if I could live somewhere where it's just raining all the time, I would in a heartbeat. I love the rain. 
not so much fun when you're sleeping outside. <laughs> so I had to deal with that for a little while. And then eventually what I did is um, I went to Walmart and I got one of those gigantic like 10 by 10 tarps. Uh, like the giant blue tarps you normally throw over a car. I ended up getting one of those, and I slept under one of those every night. I got that. I got a sleeping bag. I was kind of set. Uh, I would like, slip into my sleeping bag, throw the tarp over me. I would, um, to make sure that, like, wind and stuff didn't come in, I would, um, so, like, set my shoes down on, on the, the sides. I would put my bag down on the sides because I, once I had this tarp, I felt a little bit safer, so I started bringing my, um, my bag out with me too with like my uh uh some of my like my game systems and stuff like my steam deck i brought my steam deck out there sometimes you know it's kind of just like extreme camping basically and then i would sleep and then in the morning the sun would normally wake me up and um i would sort of just wander around a little bit until the storage unit opened repent rinse repeat that's basically that was my life uh for about nine to ten months or so um so yeah that's that's basically what i did there were there were some i mean stuff happens there were some dark times it wasn't it wasn't the worst like i i never got mugged can you believe that like I, that's one of the things that really shocked me is like for all the weird stuff that happened to me out there you know i had you know i had people throw bottles at me i had um i had people you know yell stuff at me driving in their car i had people you know splash stuff on me i had i had all kinds of like really like bad weird stuff happen but nobody ever mugged me like sometimes i would walk around with like this like thousand dollar laptop in my bag and just i got i got off scot-free if somebody had come up to me with a knife or something and held it to me I don't know what I would have done at that point. <laughs> I don't know if I would have died trying to keep them from getting my stuff or if I would have just lost it and then just lost my job afterwards. I have no idea how I would have handled that situation, but I'll never have to find out because nobody ever mugged me. It's probably the luckiest break that I've had in my entire life. Um, but yeah, it was, it was dark. Um, I went a lot of days without eating, you know, especially when the the teaching started to slow down a little bit because I knew my priorities were I needed the storage locker. That's priority number one. Um, I need the the gym membership because I can't just I can't just smell bad. I can't I can't stink when I am trying to pull this off because one of the things that you kind of accept when you're homeless and I've I've been homeless so many times now that I I know this really well. Um, you're already in any social situation a burden on the places that you go to they don't want just homeless people hanging out that just can't be a thing um so uh one of the things you'll probably notice because i i ended up you know seeing other homeless people who are basically doing the same thing i was um they they're very reserved they keep their head down they just don't they don't make eye contact they don't they basically try and be as small a presence as they possibly can. And I know that because I'm also, I was doing that too. Like you go into a social situation and you just be small. You don't make eye contact. Um, if somebody speaks to you, you respond in the most courteous way you can, even if they're saying something rude to you. Um, I was already trying to be as little of a presence as possible. So obviously I can't, I can't do this and also smell bad that's just too much so i was making sure my laundry was getting done i was making sure i was cleaning myself at, at this local gym um and yeah it was it was pretty hard um again i was going some days without eating um it was just really hard there was uh probably the darkest time like i don't want to go over absolutely everything you know in fact this video is probably getting a little bit too long so i'm going to start wrapping this up pretty soon but um there was one time uh it was during february uh it was probably the probably the lowest point that i've had so far <laughs> during my homeless adventures um it had things had not been going well and you know I know that birthdays, uh, when you're an adult, aren't really supposed to mean anything. It's kind of just another day. Um, but, you know, for February is my birthday month, and I was facing the fact that, you know, my teaching had not gone well enough 
for me to uh, cover everything I needed. So um, I was having to move some stuff around and I was, I, I came up short when it came to getting my storage unit paid. Um, and keep in mind at this point, I had been homeless for about eight months or so. And um, I hadn't reached out to my girlfriend to help with anything financially. Um, my original plan was that she was going to help out with the storage unit a little bit to uh, relieve some of that pressure and make sure that I was uh, I was getting food and stuff. Um, and then I ended up not doing that because I wanted to... I don't, there's a lot of, I could feel that there was a lot of pressure on our relationship and a lot of it was money related. So I wanted to make sure that, that that wasn't putting more pressure than it needed to. So, um, so February was a pretty tough month and, uh, I finally for the first time reached out to see if she could help something with the the storage not paying the entire thing it was about a hundred dollars a month and i i didn't ask her to pay the entire thing um i was asking if there was a way she could maybe come in and help with like half of it you know like fifty dollars would have been enough to make sure that that was taken care of and um she said no um which you know She's got she's got her own stuff too. I don't want to make it sound like she's you know living this luxurious life on uh, on a beach somewhere. Even though technically she does live next to a beach, but I that's not what, what I'm trying to say is like she's she's also got some difficulties too. And I don't want to make it sound like you know she's not there for me financially because financially she she was paying you know at, you know her in her own words she was paying half of the rents in at my apartment when she wasn't even living there so yeah um i really needed her to help me this one time and uh it didn't happen so um like she, she said no so she had something coming up that she needed the money for and i understood that i i was completely okay with that um completely okay with that uh but you know my mom's my mom ended up <laughs> my mom and the sweetest person alive I, I have no idea what i'm gonna do with myself when she eventually passes away i i literally don't know um she knew about how hard the time i was going through was so she ended up uh, fronting me a hundred dollars for my birthday because my birthday was coming up and um, she told me uh, to use that money to get myself you know a game and then something really nice for for a dinner for like a birthday dinner and um, I ended up having to use it for the uh the storage unit and uh <laughs> sorry guys oh this is getting this is getting too serious need to need to decompress i need to need to get coffee okay all right need to get out of our feels for a second and actually get this finished so i ended up using the money for the storage unit but i lied to her and told her that I had gotten, uh, you know, a game for myself and uh, that I'd eaten something really good. And um, she was she was super happy that she was able to. Uh, that she was able to help me. I'm sorry, I'm still I'm still there. I'm still there. I need to get. <sighs> OK, she was super happy that she was able. To, I need to get back into Kudo. I'm getting I'm falling into Sammy a little bit too much. I need to get back into Kudo. That's the only way I'm going to get through this <laughs> without crying. Um, so she gave me this money. I ended up spending the entire thing on getting the uh, 
uh, the, the storage thing paid. But I lied to her, and I told her that I would gotten myself a game that I was really excited for. And uh, that I'd gotten something uh, really good to eat. Because I, I knew that if I hadn't told her that, she probably would have sent even more money. Even though she's she's not in a position where she needs to be sending people more money. And, um, yeah, that's what... It, that's I... I skirted past that one. Uh, I really, I really didn't think I was going to get past that that event, and I ended up getting through it. Because keep in mind, if I lose the storage unit, I basically just have to accept that I'm that I'm losing everything. Um, all of my like card collections, my video game collections, basically everything I had had that not transpired. I would have just lost everything. I even would have lost some of my girlfriend's stuff, funnily enough, because she was keeping some stuff in the locker too. Um, but no, I I got through it. Uh, I continued um, not eating that well. I uh, continued everything I needed, and it's probably the most frustrating thing about this situation is um, my girlfriend seems to be a little frustrated or upset with me that I was coming to her for money. Um, this was kind of like a big, probably like the biggest, like, like realization, like click light bulb moment that I had it's because I, at first I couldn't understand it. And then like, I really sat down and thought about it and I was like, okay, I get it. She has, I used to have uh, I used to have a term for this. It used to be like a concept I thought about sometimes. She has um, separated sympathy for what I'm currently going through, right? So I'm sure everybody experiences this to, to some degree where like you have friends who post on like Facebook or whatever all the time about some stuff that they're going through. And they're like, oh man, geez, the car's broken down and I'm $300 in the hole for getting it paid. And now I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to pay my rent. And you think to yourself, damn, that sucks. <laughs> I'm going to gonna reach out to them. Hey, you know what? That sucks. I hope you're feeling better. If you need to talk, let me know. But like deep down, like you, you know that if they asked you for the $300, you probably wouldn't give them the $300. Like as much as sorry as you feel for this person, you can't, you can't get so involved in their life that you throw them money to get them out of their situation. Cause you're not, you're not on that level. The, the, you're friends with them. You love them as a brother or sister, but you also like, yeah, you're probably not going to, you're probably not going to throw them that money. And I started to realize that this is kind of the, the feeling that my girlfriend currently has for me. Um, because I feel like in most relationships, if you know, that like you you need you need to do for your partner what it is that you feel like you would need to do for yourself so if the other person is you know starving and not eating if they're going two to three days without food um like you you feel that in a way that you feel that for yourself like you're the one who's going days without food or you're the one who's you know, going through the thing that the other person is going through. Like, that's kind of what it means to be in a relationship and to have that level of, that level of connection to somebody is that uh, when they encounter difficulty or when they, when they encounter problems, you feel like uh, in a need inside of you to solve it the same way that you would feel that need to solve it for yourself if it were happening to you and I realized that this wasn't really this isn't really like the place where my girlfriend's at right now um in that I I don't know it feels a little bit like I don't even know how to say it if I'm being completely honest here it's it's difficult. I think my girlfriend cares about me a lot, but I'm also worried that 
you know, the decision that we made when, you know, she, 10 years ago, almost at this point, and nine years ago, technically, but almost 10 years ago, um, you know, the decision about how a relationship was going to work and her being the breadwinner and all this stuff, um, I don't, I don't know. I think she was presented with the chance to sort of live that out or play that out. And I don't think she can handle that very well. So I don't know really where we're currently at. Um, yeah, so uh, where where was I even? <laughs> Sorry. Um, she, she was a little bit upset, I could tell, because, you know, there are these little, like, back and forths we have on Facebook sometimes, and, you know, she, she avoided me for a while, and, you know, when I brought up the, the situation that I was in, she would very quickly try and get past it, because I think in her mind, she knew that... Um, in her mind, she knew that, you know, I was at some point going to break down and try and get some money from her uh, to help with the um, the situation I was in. So uh, eventually that passed. We, we eventually got past that. And now we're at a point where... Um, <laughs> so funnily enough, she ended up moving out of the dorm that she was living in, uh, the, the, one, the $900 a month dorm. And my first thought, actually, when this happened was that, oh, okay, well, I'm going to have to figure out a way to get my stuff out of storage. Um, you need to figure out a way to get down to where she's currently living. Um, you know, it, this is this is it. We're going we're gonna to go back to living together. We're going to go back to the way things were. And uh, then it turned out that <laughs> she made the decision that she was going to find a place to live by herself, and I was going to stay here, which... <laughs> If you're playing Red Flag Bingo, check your cards because <laughs> that's that's probably on there. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of how we decided to do it. She's currently living with a really nice old couple, from what I understand, who's taking really good care of her, and um, you know, she's paying uh, what like fifteen hundred dollars a month or so to to live there. Um, she's having a really good time. She's really trying to get the most out of her college experience, which I'm really happy for. I'm, I really hope, you know, she's, she's worked really hard to get where she currently is. And I hope that she uh, gets to go to every conference. She got to go to Australia. That's pretty cool, right? I mean, I hear the, the wildlife. There's not anything that you necessarily want to be dealing with. But she got to go to Australia. She got to... Uh, travel around a bit in the u.s to go to conferences and stuff and i hope she gets to do all of that man because that is that is something that you really only get to experience once and once she starts once she actually like settles down and gets a job it's going to be a um it's it's not going to be like all this adventuring stuff that she gets to do so you know she did everything right she went through the college system just like she was supposed to she she aced all of her tests uh, all of her tests she aced all her tests and got every A and did everything she was supposed to. She really, really deserves this. I'm I'm super duper happy for her. Um, and yeah, she's kind of just living out the the rest of her time there um, at her at her college, and she's uh, trying to get through the last leg of her schooling, which is great. Um, right now, I ended up figuring out a way. You know, I ended up getting my ID, which was a big thing. And I didn't want to give up teaching, so I continued teaching the entire time I was homeless, and I'm still teaching to this day. I still teach. Um, during That's my day job, is I'm a teacher. Uh, I don't have as many students as I would like. Um, a lot of them have fallen off, and I've lost a lot of the uh, lost a lot of the avenues I had for getting new students because I've separated with a lot of the places that I used to uh, work with. But I still teach. I still do it. I still like it. Um, one of the reasons that I'm starting up this new channel, actually, is that uh, I, I really need to get out there and start finding ways to to monetize my teaching a little bit. You know, um, I've just I've hit a point where I I've accepted that for the most part I need to be, you know, on my own for this. Um, I I need to find better ways to monetize myself. Uh, whether I'm dealing with depression or anxiety or, you know, regardless of how much I've eaten, regardless of 
how bad my situation is. I, I still need to figure out ways to monetize myself better. And I'm hoping that getting into the YouTube teaching space, I'm going to be able to find more students to work with and really, you know, explore the space. I need to I need to get everything rolling so that Shio and Kosho can finally get their book series that I've been promising them for like seven years. So yeah, I need to I need to get that going. Maybe if I start getting a little bit of ad revenue again from another channel, you know, that, that can go into funding the book. The book can then go out there and get uh, some funding for the next couple of books. And then that those next couple of books can be the funding for the rest of my life. So, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of my, my idea there. Um, I ended up getting my ID and getting a job at Walmart. There, if you don't know about it, there is like a separate side gig at Walmart they offer for remodeling stores. So when a store is going through a remodel, they usually reach out and just bring on a bunch of temporaries who don't stay there permanently. And this this remodel crew, as they call them, they don't get any of the perks for working at Walmart. They don't get any any discounts, any anything. Um, and they work at Walmart basically in name alone. So you don't get any of the cool stuff. Um, and you're not a permanent uh, employee. You are only there for a certain time period and then you're let go. So I ended up working there and it went great. Um, I ended up taking kind of a leadership position where like I was the... Uh, I was the the guy who basically knew what was going on better than anyone else around me. So I would, you know, step up and be in kind of a leadership position. I would tell everybody, okay, here's what here's what we're going to do. Here's what I understand of the um, instructions. So I'm going to need you to go out and get me a couple of carts. I'm going to need you to go there, start clearing off that counter over there because we're going to need to change out the shelves. And, you know, I did that. It was cool. It, that was that was really fun. I very, I very much enjoyed that. And then when the remodel ended, you know, keep in mind during the remodel, um, I was still homeless. <laughs> so basically I would go and work a, uh, a nine hour shift at Walmart and then I would come back to the storage locker. Uh, it was an overnight shift. I should also stress. Um, I had to do an overnight shift because if I had done a daytime shift, um, I would have had to have given up my teaching, but this is a way that I can teach, but also still get money from a job. So I, um, I would work a nine hour shift and then I would take a bus back to my storage locker I would pull my sleeping stuff out of storage and I would go find a place to sleep. I ended up having to stop sleeping on the cron concrete thing because a, a security guard started getting on my case. So I, I had to stop sleeping there, but I, I just went right across the street and I found a, um, a couple of places that I could, you know, feasibly get away with sleeping there. And I would just so set up shop and then from like 8 a.m. to like noon ish i would just sleep and then i would continue my daily routine and then i would you know go clean myself up at the gym and then go from the gym to work and then that was my life for about a month um well i got established on a website called pad split which is really cool so this website is really great basically um you pay a, a fairly low rent to live in basically a giant share house with a bunch of other people. Like I currently live in a house of about eight people and you know, it's a really cool little, this cool little shindig, you know, it's about $200 a week and you know, all of my utilities are paid for my internet's paid for. Um, don't have to worry about any of that. And you know, the people I live with are, are for the most part, they're pretty cool. Like I've got a kind of a neighbor now and that's kind of one of the, reasons that I don't make content as often as I'd like to is because, you know, my my neighbor in the room next door uh, seems like a really cool guy, and I, I don't want to get on his nerves in, out here yelling about Naruto, the card game, you know, <laughs> so I try not to, I try to only record stuff when I think he's not here, and then when he is here and I have to record anyway, I try and keep my my kudo kun personality down a little bit, and I try and be as reserved as I can so I'm not annoying the crap out of him. Um, but yeah, like during the first month I had to be homeless still because there's like a verification thing. You need to get paychecks 
and like actually have pay slips that you can show pad split so that you can get your um so you can actually get approved um and yeah i mean where i'm currently at now i'm living in the pad split just like i said um so they everything around me so funniest thing the absolute funniest thing about all this if you know kudo kun lore uh i was paying to live in a stranger's garage and now somebody has renovated their garage to be a couple of rooms it's like divided in half and then you know this is a uh, half of the garage and the other one is the other half of the garage but i'm living in a garage again which is a much like nicer swankier garage and i've got uh you know hop from one garage to another but make sure that you're moving up that it's a it's a nicer garage that you move into <laughs> that's my upwards trajectory man next time i'm gonna live in like a, a really nice mansion's garage and uh see where i go from there um yeah there that's basically what I'm doing. I'm living here. Uh, I'm trying to get myself up a little bit. You know, things have been pretty rough over this past half decade or so. Um, you know, I haven't really been in too good uh, headspace, but I'm trying to get out of it a little bit. You know, make some more videos, uh, get established in some new um, communities that I've never really been established in before. Hopefully that works out. If not, you know, I've had stuff not work out before. I can deal with it. Hopefully it does, though. Um, and I'm still working at Walmart. <laughs> now I'm like an overnight stalker because uh, they really liked me during the, um, during the remodel stuff. So now I'm just like an overnight stalker. And even though I don't like it nearly as much and some of the people I work with are just gigantic pricks and I don't want to work with them anymore. Um, if I, if this, like new channel thing works out for me really well and i start getting some new students you know maybe i can maybe i can uh get my book stuff started maybe i can you know get my teaching somewhere where it's making me some real money again and i don't have to work at walmart anymore right and then once that happens i'll probably be able to make even more videos because i'll be in a place where i you know i i don't have to worry about taking a two hour bus ride to a job and then working nine hours and then get a two hour bus ride back and then having to find some time to sleep. So that'll be really fun. Okay, you know what? <laughs> I, I'm looking at the time here and I just noticed that I've been talking for a little over two hours. So let's, let's start wrapping this all this up. Um, I know I got a little emotional there for a little bit. I really don't want you guys to to worry about me. I'm okay. Um, if you're if you're worried about my relationship, um, <laughs> it's in a pro it's in a rough spot. There's really no telling whether it's going to pan out the way that we planned it would a decade ago, you know. But that's that's totally fine. That's just something that naturally happens. Um, I care about her more than anything, and it, just to make sure that there's nothing, if people are. <laughs> If people are going to go into the comments and say things like, well, why don't you just break up with her? Why don't you just break up with her? I need you to understand that I would die for this person. Um, the problem isn't that I'm not happy with the relationship, so I want to leave the relationship. The problem is I'm pretty sure our relationship is at a point where she's not happy and she's showing all the signs of not being happy and she's not able to handle the kind of relationship we had previously intended for ourselves and that I'm not meeting her expectations, but she also is just cares about me too much to uh, do anything with the relationship, right? Um, so the, again, the problem isn't that I'm not happy in the relationship and that I want to leave the relationship. It's that I don't think I'm meeting her I don't think I'm meeting her relationship goals currently and that she really doesn't have enough of a frame of reference to, you know, know that she's not as happy as she thinks she is and that she's, she should probably, I don't know. Um, 
But, you know, then again, you know, I, I really want to stress here, I could also, also just be wrong. Maybe everything's great. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm just overthinking things like I normally do. I've never really been in a healthy relationship before. I've basically had every single uh, actual relationship that I've been in has ended in the person that I was dating uh, cheating on me and then, you know, going off to date somebody else. So maybe, maybe I'm just like so worried that you know something like that's going to happen again that I'm trying to push her into it so that I have some control in the situation I don't know you know it's just one of those things you have to deal with I guess as you get older and you start experiencing more stuff I, I don't I don't know if I'm right but anyway I digress hey want to know a fun fact about me I hate it when youtubers overshare and trauma dump on their audiences isn't that isn't that great now I have become one of them. Anyways, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna start wrapping this up. I'm I'm doing that thing again where I say I'm gonna wrap it up and I start talking again. Um, again, hopefully more videos coming soon. If you're interested in the senpai thing, you know, check that out. Uh, I'm going to say it again. <laughs> if you want to, if you feel oh, if you just feel oh, if your heart just heart, if, if your heart just hurts me so badly right now, oh, you just need to do something to make poor Kurokun feel better. Sign up for the bazaar in the link uh, that is going to be provided below and help your old boy Kudo Kun out get those 10 referrals so I can get the cool looking stuff. Hopefully you will join me when I start streaming the bazaar in a couple of days. This is going to be Kudo Kun signing off hopefully for the last Q&A or update style video and uh, from now on it's just going to be nothing but good times, card gaming content, board gaming content, maybe some video gaming content in the future. All right, you enjoy the rest of your day and I'll catch you next time.